Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Banyan Books podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. And we're lucky today to be joined by Dr. Joan Borsenko. Joan Borsenko, PhD, is a Harvard Medical School trained cancer cell biologist, and a licensed psychologist who is an acclaimed healer and a New York Times best-selling author. This distinguished pioneer in integrative medicine is a world-renowned expert in the mind-body connection. Her work has been foundational in an international healthcare revolution that recognizes the role of meaning and the spiritual dimensions of life as an integral part of health and healing. Dr. Borisenko earned her doctorate in medical sciences from the Harvard Medical School, where she completed postdoctoral training in cancer cell biology. After the death of her father from cancer, she became more interested in the person with the illness than in the disease itself, and returned to Harvard Medical School to complete a second postdoctoral fellowship, this time in the new field of behavioral medicine. Under the tutelage of Herbert Benson, MD, who first identified the relaxation response and brought meditation into medicine, she was awarded a Medical Foundation Fellowship and completed her third postdoctoral fellowship in psychoneuroimmunology. In the early 1980s, Dr. Joan co founded a mind body clinic with Dr. Benson and Dr. Elan Kutz, became licensed as a psychologist and was appointed instructor in medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Her years of clinical experience and research culminated in the 1987 publication of the New York Times bestseller, Minding the Body, Mending the Mind, which sold over 400,000 copies. Author or co-author of 16 other books and numerous audio and video programs, She is the founding partner of Mind Body Health Sciences, LLC, located in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Today, Dr. Joan is with Banyan Books in conversation about the new and revised edition of her now classic book, Pocket Full of Miracles, Prayers, Meditations, and Affirmations to Nurture Your Spirit Every Day of the Year. Originally published in 1994, This book is a powerful collection of spiritual practices to help you create miracles every day of the year and is now updated and revised with Dr. Jones' decades of experience with the mind-body connection. If you'd like to learn more about today's honored guest and her work, you can visit her website, which is joanborisenko.com. Banyan Books community, please join me in a very warm welcome for Dr. Joan Borisenko. Dr. Joan, thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Ross. I have such happy memories through the years, those 17 books, coming in person to Banyan in the old days before we could do this online. And it is such a wonderful place, the whole sense of it. For me, it's like the nidus of spiritual practice, um, really, in Canada. It's absolutely magnificent. Oh, thank you. 
Thank you for saying that. Now, in, in the, the intro to this new edition, you talk about your experience over the years of seeing people at different conferences and speaking engagements, bringing in their old beat up copy of Pocket Full of Miracles or Pocket as you endearingly call it and getting you to sign it. And some have even had you sign it numerous times. Can you just tell us about the life that this book has taken on over the years and your experience? Oh, you know, it's, it's amazing. I wrote it back in 1994, but because it's about the perennial philosophy, it doesn't really get out of date. Nothing has changed since the beginning of time. And we, we as we'll get into, I look at it from the point of all traditions. And what fascinates me about the history of the book is in part, um, I've always spoken to two different audiences. One of them is a more scientific audience. And, you know, I've, I've talked at more hospitals than I can tell you. And my original field of research was psychoneuroimmunology, how our mind affects our body, you know, not only the immune system, but really every system. And that, that's always surprised me when people at a scientific conference would come up with a copy of Pocket Full of Miracles, because frequently people think, ah, uh, scientists aren't interested in spirituality, but you know, they are. <laughs> <laughs> scientists are people and have their own lives. I kind of have three hats because I'm a scientist, but I'm also a psychologist and I speak at a lot of psychology conferences. Same thing. Um, psychologists would come with copies of this book. And then, you know, because I, I'm a spiritual educator as well, I <laughs> I speak at a lot of spiritual conferences, and the point I'm trying to make is all three places um, are places where people are interested in the perennial question of, like, how can I be happy? How can I be present? Uh, how is it that when I can stop the mental chatter and the internal dialogue, something deeper comes up. I'm more intuitive. I'm more joyful. And it's been so cool over these last years since 1994 to see the neuroscience um, of these things. I'm sitting in a vacation rental in Tucson, and two of the guests who've also been here are His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Timothy Leary. So oh. that, and I think, wow, that's a good vibe that we've got going here. But, you know, in terms of science and spirit, um, I've had the chance to be with His Holiness on a number of occasions, which is, I mean, truly a grace. But he was the one who many years ago, like in the 1990s, took um, Richie Davidson, who's a psychologist and neuroscientist aside and said to him, can you do something to understand um, compassion and how that uplifts and how it changes the brain and nervous system? So the whole of modern neuroscience of happiness and a lot of the positive psychology came out of his holiness's interest in science and neuroscience so that's cool <laughs> that's really cool yeah and then of course timothy leary um inspired well he he was there i think at the time that richie davidson was at harvard and the the operative question of that time is like okay People can have temporary states, mystical states, where suddenly they have a sense of unity with all that is. And the sense of egoic self-concern of I, me, and mine goes away. And it's like the sun, <laughs> the sun comes out. But the operative question was, while that's a temporary state, 
can you make it an actual enduring trait so that your mind goes more to that state than the much more limited state of rumination about self. And that was part of the update of this from 1994 of Pocket Full of Miracles was to add some of that little bit of self-directed neuroplasticity, noticing the good states and when you notice savoring them so that you begin to build neural circuits that are present and looking for joy and um, compassion becomes more of a natural state uh, and that's really that's the important thing beautiful that makes me think one of the things that i was really interested in was uh, the science around prayer and you talk about Larry Dossie's work and you talk, you mentioned in one, in one section about Agnes Sanford and her directed prayer and there's directed and non-directive prayer. Can you tell us about the difference between those two as well as what's going on in our, in our yeah. neurology and that? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge Larry Dossie's work. He's a very um, close colleague of mine. In fact, he and his wife, Barbara Dossie, who is an incredible scientist. She's been um, you know, at the forefront of holistic nursing for many years. But Larry has written a number of books about prayer and about unit of consciousness. And if people haven't read his book, his latest book, which is called One Mind, I would really suggest it. Um, that used to drive my publishers crazy when I would tell people to go out and buy other people's books. <laughs> Make sure it's a twofer. Get Pocket Full of Miracles, doing Revised, and then get Larry Dossie's book, okay? But I can't help it. And I mean, this book is, is a synthesis of so many different spiritual traditions, psychology, science, and certainly Larry. And I do talk about um, research in prayer and in a nutshell um, you know there what what Larry Dossie talks about is directed and non-directed prayer so um, a non-directed prayer might be a simple prayer of gratitude you know when you're taking in the goodness of the universe by being grateful for, you know, a sunset or meeting a new friend or having a fun conversation and you feel it in your body and you're radiating that. That's to me the most natural form of, of prayer. Directed prayer is, you know, when you're, you're focused on something specific, for example, we could all do a directed prayer for Ukraine. Um, and I think we will do a little meditation yes. shortly, Ross. Yes. And that's where we're really directing that energy to a very specific intention. And what, you know, what Larry Dossie really talks about in his review of prayer is that when you have truly an emotional investment in something, then the prayer becomes more, more powerful because concentration is more powerful. And there is, you know, the effect of prayer is not huge. It's a small effect. Many studies show that there's a small effect of, of prayer. But what they're not really looking at in most studies is there's a big effect on the prayer. And... <laughs> The one who is praying and the state that it puts you in is important. So if enough people pray, we know, yeah, it makes, it makes a difference. For example, um, but it always makes a difference, even if you don't get the immediate result in the outer world. We have to think of the result in the inner world. I think if His Holiness was talking about prayer, he might say something like it's a wise selfish practice and that is it's wise because it works for others and it's wise because it helps yourself mm -hmm. so <laughs> that's good so 
when I was writing this book, there was a really interesting article that came out in the Yale Journal of Conflict Resolution. And it looked at the effect of a large group of people meditating in any area, whether it was, you know, one experiment was in the United States. Another one was, uh, was a big conference of TM, and I forget exactly where it was, somewhere in the Middle East. And what they noticed was that during the conference, when there were all these meditators focusing on being peaceful, the number of incidents in the war in Lebanon dropped significantly. When they were doing this in the United States, in Washington, D.C., the number of hospital deaths and admissions and violent crimes dropped significantly. Um, but it's hard to control for prayer studies. But anyhow, that gives you some sense. So prayer, prayer is a good thing. Um, and like all good things, it, it, it works for everybody, the one who's doing it. And, um, certainly your family, if prayer is putting you in a more generous frame of mind, the vibes you're giving out to the people that you love and care about improve. The vibes that you're giving out, like to the cashier at the grocery store, <laughs> improve. And, um, you know, I, I think somewhere in here, I talk a little bit about Gandhi and his perennial and important phrase, be the change that you want to see in this world. So prayer, I think our lives can become a prayer as we become that change. Thank you for that. Now, maybe we can just kind of, for those who maybe aren't familiar with Pocket Full of Miracles, sort of give an overview of the way that the book is structured. And it's a, a very beautiful structure that you, you sort of summarize. I'll kind of hold up the image here for people to see what you title it, A Mandala of Angels. Oh, yes. And there's this wonderful uh, structure um, with the northern gate, eastern, southern, and western gate, and each one has a corresponding archangel and season, and of course, the, each one has three months within it, and, and you go through the book with each day of the year. Can you tell us a little bit about how you, how you came to this structure, because it kind of brings together some different traditions? Well, it does. You know, I have to say, the book was essentially a download. I got it at a particular time in my life. Um, you know, when I wrote this, the, I, had, I had spent quite a lot of time in the 80s since, you know, the AIDS epidemic started in Boston, I think around 1982. I was running a mind-body clinic. And I, I sat, unfortunately, at many, many deathbeds and heard and co-experienced a number of mystical experiences. Then my own mom died in 1988, and my son Justin, who's 20 at that time, and I both went into the light at the time of her death. Both of us had a vision. Both of us had an experience like a near-death experience, but now they're called shared death experiences. And I mean, the, to talk about the light, there's no, there are no words you can give to it. It's like pure loving kindness, just absolute pure loving kindness. And to think that's the basic energy of creation is pure loving kindness is an amazing thing. And I was steeped in that during that period of about 10 or 15 years, I had pretty continuous mystical experiences and experiences of light. And during that time, the book just started to, to come through and the seasonal energies. I mean, it's, um, I wrote it when I was in Boston, we had four seasons. And every season, I love nature. I'd be out in nature. And I would think, oh boy, this is like 
the month of rebirth, everything starting to, to come out. And I would think things like, I think March, the, the month we're in, the theme of March is courage, because for me, um, it, it's like, it's a time of rebirth and it takes courage to face your own limitations and your own darkness so that you can come out into the light of spring. And for like every month, I just as the month came, I'd get a download about it that came, you know, directly, I'd say, from my own connection with nature um, and with, with the Mother Earth. And of course, with the, the change in the sun, uh, there's nothing better after a long winter than to go out on a mild day and feel the sun on your face. It just <laughs> does amazing things for the body-mind <laughs> system. But that's how it came about. And then, you know, it's interesting because there's a, 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 a Hebrew prayer. It comes, it's a bedtime prayer comes from a prayer called the Bedtime Shema. And the four archangels are, you sing to them and they're all arranged on a different side of the body. And if you think about that, you know, think about yoga for a minute, all mixed traditions. For example, um, if you're doing a forward bend, that's Paschimottanasana a stretch to the Western side of the body. And like in Hebrew, the Archangel of the West, which would be in back of you is Raphael. And that means in Hebrew, um, the healer of God. In front of you, you have Uriel. In Hebrew, Or means light, El means God. Uriel is the light of God, the Archangel of Spring. And then depending, you know, different traditions put the other archangels, Michael and Gabriel, in different places. But whether you're talking about your right or the left, the east or the west, um, here in this book, I've got um, Gabriel on the right. And so that's, um, you know, that's the archangel of summer. But Gabriel means the strength of God from the Hebrew Gevorah. And uh, Michael is very interesting. It means the likeness of God. It's interesting to reflect what would that mean, the actual likeness of God. And for me, in terms of my own um, experience, that's pure loving kindness, absolutely pure loving kindness. And yet there's strength. If you look at, you know, the old pictures of Michael, he's got a sword <laughs> and often is thought of as the warrior angel. But you think of that maybe as the sword of discernment. It's really interesting to reflect what are these energies? They're energies. We think of them as beings, but they're energies. And so for each season, there's an energy and then within that energy, every month, um, you have different things that, that come along. So February, we just, we just finished um, the, well, a month ago almost, <laughs> we came out of February. But that, like the topic there is compassion. It's all about loving kindness. Can I read today's entry? People, that would be wonderful. I'd love that. Yeah, actually. give people yeah. a little bit. So each each day, it's meant that maybe like a lot of people, they're very spiritual, um, and they may have a tradition, or or they may be spiritual and not religious. This is not trying to convert anyone to any religion. It's a sa a seasonal sampler where practices from a variety of traditions um, augment the seasonal energies. So there's always a seed thought, and then there's a prayer or practice. So the seed thought for today, March 23rd, is this, 
the Swiss psychiatrist and mystic Carl Jung often discussed the shadow, that hidden part of ourselves that is the home of both unspoken fears and unexpressed creativity. Dr. Jekyll's problem was that he tried so hard to be good that he disowned all his natural impulses to risk, to rebel, to be passionately alive. These disowned parts of himself took on a life of their own in the form of the very objectionable, destructive Mr. Hyde. So, <laughs> as I was saying, it takes um, intention and sometimes a lot of bravery to see the parts of yourself that are lurking in the shadow. But if you're trying to get to the light, you got to go to the shadow. So the prayer practice, great spirit. I thank you for a fresh spring morning and for the courage to become whole by accepting with clarity both my darkness and my light. Today, Pay close attention to the judgments you have about other people, which are clues to what lies hidden in your own shadow. Is that person too joyful? Whatever happened to your own joy? Is that person too angry? How do you handle your own anger? Be sure to own your projections about others with the affirmation we learned February 18th. And I am that too. <laughs> and that's actually a quote of Ram Dass, um, who always said to people, every time you make a judgment about somebody else, own it, you're judging it because it's something within you too that bothers you. And it's like people, I had, I had, Oftentimes when I went to conferences or gave talks here or there, I was signing books. I was signing it for the third or fourth or fifth or sixth time. There's one guy, <laughs> I signed his book seven times. <laughs> so <laughs> it was interesting. They were dated because it's the kind of book every time you go through it because you've changed and your perspective has changed over the years. Every, every entry, you know, hits you at some new level when you read it. So that's, that's what I particularly love about this book. It's great for me. I look and say, holy moly, did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can see how it would just be a book that you keep by the bed and you can just keep going back to it over and over again. Yeah. Now, I wanted to just cover one of the one of the sections, which is the northern gate, represented by Archangel Michael. The season is winter. The January theme, which is it's the first month in the book, it starts with January. The theme is the foundations of spiritual practice. Now, I thought this would be a nice way to tie into uh, passing over to you to lead our audience through uh, a centering or a prayer practice. Wow. And, and but before that, I wanted to just ask you because you you tell people even if they start the book in a different time of year to to read over those first couple of months to really understand the foundations of practice. Yes. Why are the foundations so important in spiritual practice? Well, I'm going to read you this: the lessons and practices this month are designed to awaken the longing within our hearts for union with the divine beloved. So it sets the basic intention for what do you want to do spiritual practice anyhow, um, to have that miracle of getting out of I'm me and mine. And, you know, Aldous Huxley called the brain like a reducing valve. There's so much more out there, but we reduce it to what we need for our own survival. So we really need the sense of motivation, like, ah, there's something bigger out there. This pure loving kindness. There is a sun within my own heart. Um, and that's what we need is that motivation. So that's part of the foundation 
Um, so through prayer, meditation, and breath awareness, that's where I like to to start for for all of us. It's like almost I'm sure the, the people who are tuned in, I know you've got a great spiritual community um, uh, with your online banyan and people who come in. But even if you've been at this for years, especially, you know, you've got to get back to your breath. That's the anchor. That's the foundation. When your mind has gone nuts and everywhere else in meditation, it's the breath that brings you back. And of course, we know the whole science of that, the whole physiology of what goes on with the vagus nerve and how that calms down. Um, the fear centers of your brain. So we want to start um, not only with, with that, but with, you know, thinking about, hmm, what am I doing here? So for example, I just opened the book randomly to the seed thought for January 14th. What am I doing on earth so far from home? I can no longer remember the bright fields from which I came except in dreams. And even these I forget upon awakening. My heart's desire is to awaken from the dream of this life in this life that I may rejoice in the divine union here and now. I am ready to wake up now. So you get that kind of a basic motivation from practice and then the basics of what do I need to be present? What do I need to be here? What do I need to do to calm down the fearful ego so that sun within my heart can like creep out from behind the clouds of my conditioned awareness and I can realize that unit of consciousness if only for a few minutes. But if you don't know what you're looking for, you're not going to easily find it. So <laughs> that's the motivation, the knowledge, like, ah, there's something bigger. That's why we start with foundations. Would you be willing to guide us through a practice? Would. So one of my favorite meditation practices is in this book. And let's say there's a whole section at the end of it. Um, of meditations where they're all kind of gathered together and there are you know all kinds of breath meditations concentration meditations centering prayer um, meta meditation it goes on for many pages mindfulness shamatha vipassana um, but this is called the egg of light and it's been my favorite for a long time. So let's do just a, you know, a few minute version of it. So uh, I welcome all of you who are watching this uh, to allow your eyes to close and just to become present to the fact you have a body. What an amazing being you are. You're a spiritual being in a physical body and your physical feet are touching the ground. And so just notice that, how the earth holds you so tenderly. And then imagine that above your head is a great star of light. I like to think of that center of light around which all the universe is spiral, the original big bang or big breath, and allow a sensation of that light to flow down around you, washing over you like a waterfall and entering through the top of your head and washing through your body. It's chi, it's living energy, it's loving kindness itself, light washing through your eyes and your ears that you see and hear with newness 
and presence washing down through your tongue and your throat that you speak with beauty and truth washing through you, washing down through your shoulders and arms and hands, right out the tips of your fingers, light washing down through your lungs and your heart, you can really direct that light to any place that needs healing. But for now, just feel that waterfall of light coming down through your belly, through all your inner organs, down through your bottom and your thighs, your calves and your feet. Light washing through you. And as that light washes through you, let it wash away any old energy that is used now, is done with. And it can wash that old energy right through the bottoms of your feet. So you're just a conduit for light. And allow that light to wash clean the boundaries of your heart revealing the light that is within you, your own heart's light, your connection to source. And now imagine that the light within you can spread out from your heart through your whole body, meshing with that light from above, forming this great beautiful matrix of loving kindness and feel that light surrounding you, three or four feet above you, below you, on all four sides of you. So it looks like an egg of light. And now imagine that all the good thoughts from other people can penetrate this egg of light and reach you and enliven you but all the negative thoughts from others will be repelled by the egg of light, bounce off and return a blessing to the sender. And imagine now that your own good thoughts about others will come through your egg of light and go out as a prayer and a blessing for them and all of your own negative and limiting thoughts will bounce back from the inner <laughs> part of that shell of light and a blessing of awakening and love will return to you. And so let's sit for a moment in our egg of light and feel it. And you may feel that energy, or you may just be planting a seed so that you'll feel it a little bit more each time you do this meditation. And now you can focus your energy in a directed way and send blessings of loving kindness to others. So tonight, Let's magnify our prayer by sending it together to Ukraine and to Russia and to all of the countries that are receiving now um, refugees from Ukraine and just send light there, the divine light, the highest good. You don't have to direct it, just send a light. And so, our time for this meditation is coming to a close. And so back to your body, feet on the floor hands in your lap or however they are, and of course back to your breath. 
taking a couple of conscious breaths, feeling your body rise to the light as you breathe in, and feeling your body settle to the tender embrace of the mother as you breathe out. knowing that your breath is always there for you, that you're always moving between earth and heaven that come together within the goodness of your own heart. So, time to come back from meditation, open your eyes <laughs> and See the goodness in yourself and imagine all these other people who are here at this webinar and all the goodness that conjoins when all of us come together. Oh, thank you so much for that, Dr. John. So welcome. We've got some questions coming in from the live audience here. And, and uh, if you're open to it, we can attend to some of those and I'll encourage people to keep sending them in. Absolutely. There's a question from Jerry Lynn, or I'm not sure the pronunciation of it's Jerry Lynn or Jerry Lynn. So mind, mind my uh, poor pronunciation if it's wrong. Uh, they say, I have anxiety and am thinking of asking my doctor for medication. I would rather not do that. In addition to meditation, are there other practices that would help me? Well, yes, um, yes. And I also wanna say, <laughs> my grandmother, my Jewish grandmother was a Christian scientist. That was, you know, pretty much the only mind-body <laughs> path around with some good precepts. One day my brother was sick and my grandmother was there and she called some of her Christian scientist prayer group to pray for my brother. And when they left, she said to me, Joni, if he doesn't get better, you know, in a couple of hours, I'll call the doctor. And I said, really, Grandma Libby? I thought the Christian scientists didn't call the doctor. And she said, since when could a doctor not be an answer to your prayers? So <laughs> I feel that way about medications. They're overprescribed. They can be harmful, but at times they're necessary for a little while. So, you know, just, just to say that. Okay, so one of the things that can be very, very helpful for anxiety, and you probably know this, is exercise. So that for both anxiety and depression. But when you find yourself in the grips of anxiety, my, my favorite technique is what I call the gear shift breath. And what that is, is like purse-lipped breathing. And that affects the vagus nerve very quickly, which helps to reduce anxiety. And this is what it looks like. You breathe in through your nose fully and completely, purse your lips, and then breathe out as slow as you can till every drop of breath is gone. When it's all gone, another in breath. And then you breathe out slowly through pursed lips. What you'll find is that each succeeding out breath gets longer and longer. And it's the fastest way to make a physiological shift out of the amygdala, the fear center of the brain. Another technique, um, and that's always where I start. I use a lot in traffic, <laughs> by the way, just a few breaths. 
so that I can be present, like merging lanes, something like that. But do not meditate while you drive. The breath of two to <laughs> calm you down is very different. Meditation <laughs> does not go with driving. But another thing, let's say you've got a, you know, a particular fear going on. You know, name it. We all have fears of, of different kinds. Um, let's say you have fear of, um, let's say it's an economic fear or how about fear of an illness, whatever it may be. What the research shows is that if you actually name the fear, it engages a part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, and it reduces fear. So a wonderful psychiatrist, Dan Siegel, whose books I highly recommend, <laughs> what he says is name it to tame it. So I like to take a few gear shift breaths, shift out of that high arousal, and then name the fear. It's like fear that whatever it may be, whatever your fear may be. Um, and then just stay with it for a minute or so. And I know that's counterintuitive to stay with your fear. But if you're just mindful and you're saying, hmm, where do I feel the fear? Oh, it's a butterfly over here or tightening of the heart over there. You become curious about the anxiety and you're actually witnessing it rather than feeling helpless and letting it assault you. So you've changed your physiology, you've named the fear, and now you're being curious about it. That can sometimes really help, particularly over time. Another thing that can help in a very immediate way is enlarging your perspective. You know, when we're afraid, we're like inner directed and we're having fantasies of whatever it is that we fear. Look up at the sky make a bigger horizon, you know, look at the clouds, the color, be curious about something larger. And that can also be a, a big help. So, Gerilyn, I wish you good fortune with this. And the last thing I'll say is that if you view difficulties instead of obstacles on the way, you view them because I have this difficulty. <laughs> it's making me practice and teaching me things. Then you can see your anxiety as difficult as it is. And believe me, I don't underestimate how painful anxiety can be. Nonetheless, it's a doorway to something larger. And so many blessings on your journey. Thank you so much, Dr. John. And yes, wishing you all the best, Gerilyn. Uh, there's a question from Sabina who says, practice requires dedication to the ritual, ritual, to the habit, to the repetition. In a society with an ever decreasing attention span, how do we, teachers, etc., assist seekers to get to the point of practice? You know, that's an interesting question, and it's actually why I wrote the book, because very often there's an intention. I'm going to meditate, you know, when I get up or before I go to work, it doesn't happen, and then you feel bad about yourself, and then you marinate in the, I can't do it, and I can't stick with it. And I used to, you know, I ran a mind-body clinic, uh, and people were motivated because they came there because of anxiety or depression or physical illness of some sort. And this is like, in part, Pocket Full of Miracles came about because it's concrete. It's easy. You pick it up in the morning. There's your seed thought. There's a prayer or a practice. Um, and you know, what I find is it's all about if you can get yourself just to sit with something um, and know I could finish this in two minutes or, gee, you know, now that now that I'm reading this, 
um, you know, on many of the prayer practices, the last line is like, here's May 17th. I just opened it up, spent a few minutes practicing the mindfulness of shamatha vipassana meditation, calm abiding, insight. And once you do a minute of that, I mean, you're already into it. And it's likely that you'll want to spend a few minutes at it. So that's why I wrote this. Um, right in the introduction, <laughs> I make exactly the same point um, that you're making. Let's see, where is it? You can tell I read the books, <laughs> know where things are. Uh, but what I say is the time pressures of modern life are such that few of us can engage in long periods of daily prayer and meditation. Although your heart may call you to a contemplative life, the need to earn a living may pull you in the opposite directions. Pocketful of Miracles is meant to provide the inspiration and framework for a universal spirit, spiritual practice that fits easily into most schedules. The daily lessons can generally be completed in 10 minutes or less, although at times you might want to spend longer. So, you know, at the risk of being self-serving, try this. Yeah. Well, there's something self-serving yeah. serving that serves <laughs> others, that serves others great. Right. It's a beautiful, wonderful book. It really is. Very helpful book. Thank you, Ross. There's a question from Teresa who's wondering, have you ever recorded a CD of guided meditations? Oh, I have a lot of them. <laughs> you, can, you can go to my website, johnborisenko.com. Uh, you can buy them off my website. You know, by the way, um, if you go to my website, you'll see that there's also a kind of a little companion um, uh, well, it's a little program. It goes through every week. You get the spiritual practice of the week delivered to your inbox, and it's always very short. And it's not exactly the same as Pocket Full of Miracles, but it's based on it, and it's called Pocket Full of Blessings. And there are great little practices from self-directed neuroplasticity, positive psychology. There's always a meditation every month that I've pre-recorded so that you get all of that. So take a look at Pocketful of Blessings because, you know, sacred practices delivered to your inbox. <laughs> Sounds so, pretty yeah. nice. <laughs> and your website is joanborisenko.com, right? Uh -huh you have to just know how to spell Borisenko and because somebody's probably thinking of it. It is of course a Ukrainian name, the E-N-K-O um, ending is Ukrainian. And um, my, my former husband who I was married to for 24 years who drew the mandalas that begin each season, uh, Miroslav Borisenko, Miroslav means glory to peace, um, has many relatives in the area of Lviv and Kiev. Yes, there's a Miroslav Mandela. So um, I, I really am focused very much on the plight of the Ukrainian people right now. Yes. Yeah. We're certainly all sending love. And that was so beautiful. You uh, drawing our attention and sending that light and love to all those affected right now. We're coming close to the end of our time before my final question for you, Dr. Joan, I just want to remind people we've been speaking to Dr. Joan Borisenko about the new and revised edition of her now classic book, Pocket Full of Miracles. Of course, you can get it at banyan.com, B-A-N-Y-E-N.com. Please, everyone, support your local independent bookstores. Dr. Joan, I wanted to ask you, you've been working in mind-body medicine for many years now, and I'm wondering if there are anything 
any pitfalls that you've seen over the years around the teachings of feeling empowered for how our mind can change our health and how those can be misinterpreted and how they can be empowering. That seems like a really important issue in this arena. Oh, yes. I mean, it's really an enormous question. And, you know, the main, the main thing is you can misuse anything and be too self-critical. So people who, you know, generally speaking, if you meditate, if you get into the present moment, you're decreasing the effects of stress on your body. And, um, you know, the use of imagery, there's lots and lots of good evidence. However, um, sometimes what you've got is not going to be cured with your mind. So you have to be open-minded and say, sometimes my body needs some help from the outside. It's like my Christian science grandmother. Um, that's exactly what I embodied. I learned that lesson when I was six years old and do my best to use mind and body. You know, I had both of my hips replaced in 2017. And I am absolutely, first of all, grateful for surgery <laughs> because um, without it, I would not be hiking and doing yoga at this point. So I'm happy with that. But my recovery, I think, was so fast because I meditated. I did imagery, I sent healing to those new hips, I, you know, adjusted my attitude to literally an attitude of gratitude, and I was just sure that I was going to recover quickly, and that really was a big help to me. Um, I think it made an enormous difference. So use it all. We're here, we're earth beings, use it all. And uh, that's the main thing I want to say, be flexible and open-minded. Beautiful, thank you. And I do have one more question for you and it's perfect because Jacob, our wonderful uh, event curator and podcast producer just sent it through to me. And a big thank you to Jacob for everything that he does for all of us in Banyan Books. And of course, a huge thanks to everyone who put in questions and the whole Banyan community. You're so amazing. Um, the question is, the book is called Pocket Full of Miracles. And Karen asks, well, what is a miracle? <laughs> a miracle, if you've ever read A Course in Miracles, is a shift in perception, um, seeing something differently. And I think the big miracle is this, that we are earthly beings, um, our, our nervous system can't be open to everything. It can't be open to unit of consciousness because we have to survive. We have to be focused. I mean, that's part of the reason why we see so much negative stuff. We have, it's a survival thing. We don't want that lion to catch us and eat us. So we tend to have a very narrow perception that perceives us as separate from other things, that perceives us as separate from the earth. It's like, if you saw that we were all one, there would be no litter, for example. Um, at every level, that kind of myth of separation limits us. And so the big miracle is seeing from a different perception that in fact, everything is connected to everything else, that there's only one consciousness that manifests in these different ways that appear to be separate, but in fact are linked. So that's the miracle, that change in perception from separateness to the recognition of wholeness and unity. Wonderful. Dr. Joan, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. It was really a, a treat to have you here. Ross, thank you so much. And Jacob and Banyan Books. And I hope people will keep tuning in to your podcasts and order their books from Banyan.
So thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. And I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.